a summary of events in 2018. Um, I'm going to forget about things, and I'm also not going to mention things, but on the 17th of July, Christie's London um, hosted their own summit, a one-day summit that was called Exploring Blockchain, is the art world ready for consensus? Um, it was covering basically a lot of things for a very short time period. Um, and I think this is uh, interesting because it was for the art world and a lot of them wouldn't necessarily know what blockchain is. So to have this kind of a big topic for one day, um, I don't think anyone really grasped what blockchain is to be honest. We also had an exhibition here in Berlin, Proof of Work, where Billy and Kia, Kia, yeah. Kia uh, was a part of. It was at the Schinken Pavilion, and it ran from the 8th of September and 21st of December. Um, it was curated by Simon Denny in dialogue with this recent gallery, Ham van, uh, van den Dorpel, Sarah uh, Hammermann, Sam Hart, Kia Kreutel, Odi Lunay and Annalisa Schiffos. Um, the exhibition brought together works engaged with culture around Bitcoin and blockchain, entertaining crypto as a possible new infrastructure for money, computing, and organizing. On the 5th of December, when um, Art Basel Mayani happened, there was also Adam Lindemann hosted his own um, summit as well on the art of blockchains. Um, one of the topics was um, how can blockchain cr um, develop creativity, and it was done with Kenny Scharf, which had a live painting consisting of 100 canvases. Um, every person who attended that was supposed to get a canvas as a notion of getting a part of a blockchain. Um, that did not go really well, though. Let's hope this works. Oh, how do I? There we go. It literally became chaos because people were sitting around the table, ran up and grabbed canvases uh, from, yeah, without even considering each other and just really kind of went for it, went crazy. So like Black Friday. A bit like, yeah, it was a bit like the Black Friday of blockchain and art. We also, in 2018, Kevin Abboch um, created I Am Coin, which is an interesting piece of art because it combines the two aspects of physical, physicality, but also the notion of blockchain because it exists of 100 limited prints made of his own, bl own blood, stating the Ethereum contract address on which the project was built on and is depending on. Beside this, um, it also consisted of a, a 10 million vir vir virtual artworks in the shape of standard ERC20 tokens. So I think this one is really interesting from the perspective of combining both elements, the physical element of the art world, but also the element of blockchain. And without the either or the either, the blockchain or the piece wouldn't exist. So this leads me to the big question of where are we going in 2019? After all these events that happened, many of them which I did not mention, but some of them which I did mention, where, is, where, where are we going? How is the bridging going to happen between the two communities? Because I think right now, even if there's initiatives going on, like proof of work or... Um, conferences and summits or artists trying to work with blockchain and vice versa as well, I still think there's a lot of conversation and um, knowledge, knowledge exchange that needs to happen for us to be able to really bridge and use the strong sides of both communities. Okay, um, so 
um, a little bit of introduction. So basically, this is one of the first pilot projects for the Department of Decentralization. And basically, we're going to run different, uh, different projects that are uh, angled towards things that we care about. Some of them, obviously, will be about building tooling, uh, such as Girly, or some of them will be about Tupac. Some of them will be uh, about education as we launched. Uh, can you get Tupac? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's hard being a mother. <laughs> and uh, and our project is actually there's no such thing as a uh, code name. There's no such thing as blockchain art. But obviously, this is just a, a name that's set to provoke you. Um, the article actually is very very blockchain friendly. And um, what we aim to do is actually find a way forward and define classes of arts on which some are actually blockchain art, some are inspired, and obviously there's the, uh, the whole market aspect that we will try not to touch. So please, Billy, don't talk about hardware taxes. About okay? <laughs> because this is about... <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to target Billy every once in a while, it feels good. <laughs> no, but uh, the idea is that we can all uh, say what we want to say and how we feel that blockchain art is, or, you know, the notions also of NFTs and physical ownership. Oh, oh fuck. He wants, the, he wants the water, yeah. The, is there a cup? In my hand? Yeah, or a cup, or a cup. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, yeah, and then after all of this discussion, uh, so we launched the first article, and it was actually really well received. And then after this, we're going to write a comprehensive report. Everyone that wants to collaborate will collaborate. And the way that we will do this is basically we will set up the framework for the article in, in, te in technical terms. Uh, and then everyone will be able to contribute a paragraph of up to 500 words. It will be edited into a more you know, article reports or paper form, and then it will be peer reviewed again by everyone. But we are opposing to the idea of doing some kind of Google Doc or something because it will lose the, you know, the, the aspect, the, the shape of the article and the, you know, we need to run it through hard editing. So yeah. Um, just also, it's one small thing. So this session is being recorded. So please, if you want to be recorded, it's through the mic. And it's an open discussion, but also be mindful if someone's speaking, please don't speak over that person, but, you know, let that person speak to um, full stop, and then you can answer. So, um, I think it's really, really interesting where you have, um, um, that you have a lot of art that's dealing with the subject. However, that's, for me, is art that's informed by blockchain and the technology, whereas I would say that that's not blockchain art. Um, that's, for me, I'm, I'm coming from the art world, just to give you that, I'm not from the technical background, um, but for me, I think what's interesting with that is that there is a, um, there's the potentiality of having two categories and to what extension does this, these categories actually need to exist? Do we need these categories or is it the same and, um, yeah, is there, is, is art informed by blockchain, one category, and is blockchain art another category, or should they be considered to be the same? Um, yeah. Well, in, in, you know, in thinking about that category, I actually tried to explain Stina while uh, she was writing the article. The same question that we, as technologists, we asked ourselves, does it absolutely need a blockchain? or not, uh, and uh, I, am tr I am proposing here, therefore, to actually define blockchain art as the art that absolutely needs a blockchain to exist. For example, another example, it's not, uh, I am a coin, but actually the proof of uh, the foam uh, artworks that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Kia. Uh, so it was basically a big giant bubble and it was connected to a GPU and it was mining and at the same time it was pumping a huge bubble. Uh, it's the one that, Tina, does it need a blockchain? 
Well, you know, it was mining, and that mining was providing the, uh, the pumping energy, so I would, I would say yes, I, I'm open to, to other. So that's another, that's another example. And then, uh, obviously, after checking uh, what Kevin did, obviously, he, he did a very, very basic contract. He did the contract himself. We asked him, and um, obviously, the work can't exist without the blockchain because it would be really, imagine if you would just distribute the ERC-20s by yourself, like here, have an ERC-20. So I think that's basically what is properly blockchain art. And on something that's uh, art inspired by blockchain, I would like to call, a, like for example, a, also again, sorry, Kia too, <laughs> but actually she did two, uh, two artworks and they were inspired in, um, I, it was one, the Vicentin, or maybe you want to explain them actually, right? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was also part of the Schenkel Pavilion show. Actually, if you see on the other side of the foam bubble, there's two kind of, they almost look like kind of camo-y white things on the right there. There were two paintings. Um, and they were, I tend to like tarot cards. It's just a framework for kind of assigning a set of numbers and imagery to potential scenarios. And I find, um, you know, my day job, I work at Gnosis, and I find that a lot of kind of game theory is similarly assigning a set of numbers to a set of scenarios. Obviously, the work done to get to those scenarios is much different, um, but sub both kind of studies have evolved over centuries. So I guess, in part, the paintings make the case um, of looking towards like an aesthetic of game theory as an archetypal scenario that recurs over time, and one that you try to navigate through a set of heuristics. I mean, this isn't something I would kind of like, this isn't a hill I would die on in terms of this metaphor being very similar. Um, but I would say just that these works were kind of inspired through looking more at the kind of narrative of how we use these frameworks to like understand social interaction or collaboration or, you know, kind of solving the coordination game that blockchain aims to do and how like there have been many kind of attempts at, at these heuristic forms to do so in the past. Sorry, can yeah, I just, I just want to like connect that to Maria's point, or MP's point, in terms of just like, it's not, it obviously didn't require blockchain, it's two canvases, um, you know, based on a loose theory loosely related to blockchain, but I think that there's a lot of scope, um, both formally to deal with blockchains and the narratives, but, but also more to deal with the narratives themselves and the repercussions and the imagery, and also to actually create a culture around it that isn't um, the dominant culture around fintech. I mean, in a similar vein, you're talking about sort of blockchain giving lifeblood to a lot of ideas and types of work which have existed in a long, for a long time. And uh, it actually makes me think of sort of the debates and discussion going around the distinction between net art and internet art uh, and the history of art and technology in general, um, which is really stemmed out of conceptual art. And you kind of get into this semantic war about, you know, 1990s net dot art from Ikyol Cusick or whatever, like it has to rely on the internet as a structure for it to be net art compared to post-internet art, which is art which couldn't exist if we didn't live in a world that had the internet. Uh, so you start sort of getting, you know, these boxes for semantics, but, but really it's all sort of on a spectrum of political art, uh, structuralist art, uh, conceptual art, and these sort of ideas just also kind of keep getting recycled if you look back at sort of the origin of film and film as an artistic medium and sort of structuralist and Amjud Bike sort of just trying to take apart the materials to see like what is it this thing that is new here, what can you do it actually, what are the pieces inside of it, can you break it to understand it and, and this sort of mentality happened with the internet, it's happened with network art and it's happening again with blockchain art uh, as you know a new medium uh, and I think there's a lot of different discourses and ways to approach that medium and I, I think we're kind of seeing that wide variety of them. So if you, if you look at, uh, let's say, contracts or code specifically, we can look back at the demo scene. So live coding, that that's actually been constituted as art. It's self specifically just the form and the content of, of code happening in the demo scene. We could, we could uh, look at it like that. What I'm curious about is in, when you're making the distinction, um, how do you feel about, uh, like, let's say, scavenger hunt or puzzles uh, that are done where you know, code is embedded and number, numerology that you need to solve in a painting because there's a lot of these things happening to actually claim Bitcoin. Do you class that as one or the other or both? 
Well, actually, that's a really good point in which, uh, sorry. Uh, so actually, that's a really good point. And I would classify that because it's, I, I see it as performative arts as well. Does it need a blockchain to exist? Yes. No, it rewards, uh, it rewards with that, right? So, you know, it, can, it could actually reward with gold and coins. Uh, for what it w it's worth, so I would I would actually try to classify uh, classify it on art inspired by blockchain or performance uh, or some kind of performance that's tied to blockchain, but not blockchain art per se. And the reason why I'm trying to categorize this also it's because um, as people in blockchain. Uh, we need to find a way that uh, to connect with the art world in uh, in the in their own language. You know, we cannot uh, we cannot go to the art user if you call it that way just to associate some terms and tell them like, here is the fancy blockchain. It's gonna change your life because you know what? We tried that with the users and we we ended up sounding like dicks and everyone hates us now. So if we want the uh, the art world to actually adopt us as well, we we need to start thinking like them and by thinking by like them we can also start defining categories i don't i don't like i personally don't like the condescending tone of blockchain is going to fix it all for you and especially if you're touching the the art market or if you're touching a body of work from an from an artist as well so uh, yeah that's uh, that's why i'm trying to you know start to I think one thing uh, that's important to um, differentiate is that uh, in these like murals, you know, when you can uh, like like solve the puzzle to get bitcoins, um, like the subject is uh, is uh, cryptocurrencies and and blockchain, but um, it's still a mural. It's still street art, and 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 yeah, like as MP said, like it doesn't need really blockchain to exist, but it's it's raising awareness uh, about blockchain, which is great. I mean, uh, crypto graffiti. Which I should not say crypto graffiti, but it's crypto graph um, uh, He's that's what he's done with Bitcoin since like 2013 or so. And uh, but still, he works with collage. He works with uh, painting, like you know, like things that like. And and you're right, like the subject of blockchain or like or Bitcoin specifically became like the subject of like some very 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 bad paintings. And that's kind of what like snobbish art people, when they think about blockchain art, they're like, oh, you mean like the one where like there's a huge Bitcoin sign like in front of a sci-fi background, and you're like, oh, no, not so much. Um, and then there's a the whole digital side of it because, as you said, it's like it's not new, right? It's like you every technology kind of had their um, sets of artists, and and some use the technology to get more people aware of it, use it as a, as a, as a medium um, or just a subject, but it is in continuation with digital art and So um, I want to ask one question and maybe make a consideration after that. Uh, the question is, what is the purpose of that, that we want to reach with this uh, art and blockchain uh, group? Is it uh, to define what is blockchain art, uh, to find categories, uh, define it? So continuing on what uh, Billy also was saying, uh, possibly it doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, leave freedom to use blockchain as a tool and let's discover whatever comes out of it. Or is it to explore the set of art and blockchain and see what is in the middle, for which I see there are many more things beyond net art or uh, artistic experiments and trying to define them, whatever they are. I see also blockchain useful to define new ways of collecting, uh, define new ways to sustain artists, new forms of uh, becoming messinas, if you want, without getting into our Berger tax, which I agree, <laughs> uh, and without uh, uh, talking about the pricing or the market, uh, the venial part of art. Okay, there's a lot of in the art industry world or in the art world. You mentioned this word, uh, the purpose of. We want to get uh, closer to the art world. You said something similar to this. How are we going to do this? For me, certainly not giving them a category, 
people who buy these kind of works or sustain these kind of works are by the very nature already inclined to these kind of works if they are even viable because net art is uh, difficult, you know? So it's, uh, is it us, creators uh, or consumers of this art, uh, appreciators of this art? Uh, so where in this set we want to locate ourselves and what is the purpose of what do we want to reach? Um, do you want me to answer? <laughs> I'm just going to answer quickly. So I think for, for me it's very much about the latter, so you know what's in between. And I think that, that comes from seeing what's going on, some of the events I presented. If you look at what's going on in the art world when they do present blockchain and the potentiality of blockchain within art market and art world, it's the same people over and over and over again. There's nothing new to it. It's the same kind of topics presented by the same people and I think that that for me is something that's frustrating because I think that kind of middle part could potentiality um, or have a, there's a potentiality to it however that's kind of stagnated when you only have the same people going over the same thing again and again and again so my reaction to that was that if there's lots of brilliant people that's being um, that's gathering at one point, maybe it's worth actually having this discussion and see, is, is this something? If there isn't, fine, then we have explored it, but without even exploring it, we, we don't really know if we can bring this further or if, you know, the people who is there presenting to the art world over and over again, maybe that's what we have, maybe we can get, do much better. I just wanted to add on to that because I lead, a, like I curate a blockchain art gallery in San Francisco and the way that we define that and it's, you know, this constant debate about this exact thing. It's like there's um, kind of three things that I consider to be kind of covered in blockchain art. It's like, you know, what we were saying about art that like actually uses the blockchain versus the like topics that art is able to cover such as like you know, authenticity, provenance, like all of these really interesting, you know, philosophical topics and like art theory and crit theory that kind of intersects with blockchain. And then there's also the one that, you know, kind of brought me to the scene and that I think is very important. That's one of the biggest challenges we have left, which is like, how do we address what, um, you know, the art scene, not as like Christie's, but the art scene is in like experimental art projects like this that need more funding. You know, they want to be able to connect to funding sources. And so I think it's very important to define these categories because otherwise you're not able to have productive discussions about any of them because people want it to be so many different things. So it's, you know, when we define a semantics of talking about blockchain and art, then we can really have productive discussions in each category. And, you know, if you are not familiar with the like really rich discussion that's happening around this, I really recommend kind of digging into that. And I would love, you know, to talk to people after for some like resources for how to be part of that conversation because it's really cool. Uh, I, <laughs> totally, uh, my uh, question was exactly about let's talk about sustaining artists, whatever they want to do, okay, through the blockchain in whichever you use or of the blockchain or in whichever. Uh, way of using the principles or ideas or ideals of the blockchain they want to do. Let's explore also that. So this is, I wanted to ask if that is an open possibility. And I am not sure about the semantics. If you define a category, how does that help? I would love to hear that if you want to explain that even later if you want. Or yeah, if you wanted to have a comment. Cool, thanks. Um, so I wanted to address what Steno was just saying a bit earlier about this idea of the, um, of the block the artistic blockchain scene being repeated uh, in a almost tautological process by the same people over and over again, and what sort of steps the the creative blockchain people are doing to go and democratize that sort of platform, because I feel like that's that, uh, that was the original intent, or if uh, at least on uh, at least in in theory of blockchain in, uh, in the first place to be able to go and decentralize that platform regardless of whatever medium that was propagated and not to go and co collectivize it in the hands of an elite few. So I feel like that's something that we would have to go and educate the, the general creative community on and not to have galleries go, oh, this is something that's far too radical for us. We can't, we can't adopt this. So do you feel like this is something that we need to go and shake more conservative sections of the art scene or the creative scene instead of just leaving it to run its course. 
Um, I think rather than actually shaking up, I think it's more about knowledge sharing and kind of um, exchange. Um, because the feeling I have very much with it is that, yes, you make a point with, you know, going out and shaking, shaking, um, shaking the artboard, which frankly needs to be done in many cases, but maybe this is not the right way of doing it. However, if you really need to go out and shake it as well, then maybe that's not the right platform to start with. That's something that can come later. But I think more than anything, it's about knowledge sharing and kind of using each community or allowing each community to share their strong side of knowledge. And, you know, from there, there can be collaborations. I think that that's kind of the main thing for me within it. Um, it's equally as much about going out educating the art world and the art market as it is as going to educate the tech world as well. Because I think it's also, um, it's too quite, or not quite, it's too very... Don't, don't get me wrong here, two very eccentric communities. It's two very different communities, and it's two very different knowledge, um, both equally as important, and I think both can learn a lot from each another. Uh, for me, it's also the case that we are seeing, because blockchain is actually such an open-minded world that it enables you to... Uh, open up a space of creation in your head where actually artworks can, can be produced. So um, I'm also, I also want to ask here the question, who considers themselves a creative or an artist? And just raise your hands. Uh, you know, and creative of any sorts, by all means. UX is creation to uh, design is creation to... <laughs> okay, so, you know, if we are so many people that, and we would like to get paid and we would like to get recognized by our work because it's educated work and it's as educated as any other artistic practice, then we need to generate these kind of sources of education to make them available for people. And to not, you know, we, of course, some stereotypes need to be broken and some markets need to be disrupted. But uh, it's up to them to take us. And it's up to us to actually reflect and see what we can do better. And then if they don't want to do it better, then that's their problem, you know. At least we tried in the best way that we could. Um, I actually would like to take like many steps back um, and answer to the thing that you said at the beginning. Um, I think to me, art in itself is never a necessity. So, I mean, you know, like art, it's kind of more of, um, it's, it's a lot about experimentation, right? And I think blockchain is one of the kind of new building block that just came about, like, you know, like say 10 years ago, right? Like Bitcoin anniversary, which is like a um, couple of weeks ago. And of course, when you have this new building block, like everyone wanna play with it. And I think art is, you know, it's a kind of, um, group of people which is like really ready to throw themselves into this new technology and trying out, right? And I'm, I'm sure this is going to happen in like, it's, go, it's going to happen in the future as well, right? If you have a new technology, then people are going to try to play with it. So I don't think necessity is, is the right way to, um, to address because I mean, art is like, art in itself, it's like, you know, like I don't need, I don't need to go to exhibition, you know, like all those paintings, I don't need it. But of course, uh, like it, it improved, like it, it's actually part of our civilization, right? So we still have arts and then we have like more tools to play with. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I have um, a bit of experience with, particularly in like the generating like me economies around memes and using the blockchain is like really effective for that. So like, one thing that I would say is most exciting about being able to essentially timestamp like pieces of history. So you can do really fun stuff with, um, we've seen, I, I work on a project called Pepe Dap. It's despite what you think about the Pepe the frog, it's a really um, interesting kind of memetic existence and it's obviously expanded into other things. And, and what we found is really interesting is that if you can create a platform, which we did, uh, where artists can come in and contribute kind of openly in real time, that's a really big advantage. So today, Donald Trump says something really funny, uh, whatever, you can make a meme about it and you can sell it in that moment. Um, and you can automate the process of the artist being able to get the commission. You can build smart contracts, which we've done, where we like host a marketplace that has a 4% fee, and then that 4% fee can ongoingly 
run to the artist. So the artist can get money autom in an automated way ongoing. So it, c it may not sell right away, or if it does sell, um, it, it doesn't matter, right? They can, they can just like kind of put it out there and it exists. And something that we don't really see a lot in, or maybe rather a problem with digital memes in particular is piracy. You see a lot of copying. Um, so like the origination, being able to like derive signatures and say, okay, this happened first. This person ex created this SpongeBob meme this, at this time and date, and it exists on Ethereum in this case. And also uh, Counterparty has a, a really good platform for putting digital trading cards. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not as experienced with like the physical space of art. Um, I think there's some ways to do it. There's people who make like physical cards even of the memes. Uh, so it's pretty interesting, but I'm, I'm specifically talking about memes and creating economies around the memes where digital artists now can take their Microsoft Paint um, products and these things that like really get go viral. I mean, especially if you're in like the ecosystem of Instagram and Twitter, memes are like really effective pieces of like growth and, and communication. Um, and people are able to now make money from this. So like with, with Pepe Dapp, it's essentially a copy of rare Pepe cards from Ethereum, but on a, or from Counterparty, but on Ethereum. Uh, we were able to sell thousands of cards, and we have now about 10 artists contributed, and another 10 are coming in in 2019, and these people just kind of show up from Twitter or Telegram, and it's this really kind of underground economy, open sourced. If the website dies, somebody else could build a website on top of that, and it can exist, so like the half-life is longer and you have some really interesting pieces. And it's censorship resistant, so if you made something that maybe the government doesn't like, um, you know, we're seeing this now where people are talking about taking memes off of websites if it's the wrong type of meme. Um, and these things can now exist longer. How do you think that, I, because both of them come from the art world, so I'm just going to have that kind of expertise from you guys. <laughs> I know that you're trying to do blockchain art, but, you know, work with me here. <laughs> so how would the art world see this kind of, like, wave of meme art, if we want to call it in a way? So, 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 so back in the anonymous post 4chan days and like lulsec time, I was doing all of the memes for, for lulsec. And um, interestingly, so um, topiary, uh, Jake uh, got arrested and, and you know, went through his, his period of time uh, and then he came out and then actually got started hiring as a speaker and then a play got made about the anonymous lulsec time and went on in London. And, uh, and then there was a gallery exhibition that came out of that as well. So I get this email from Jake years later, and he's like, oh, Michael, you know, can I have, I don't have these memes. Do you have any of these originals so that we can print them out large? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I sent him the digital files, and these things ended up getting, getting printed, and then ended up, actually, I think there's four pieces in the Guggenheim that got sold from the exhibition and stuff. So um, at the time that I was doing this meme stuff, I, uh, in WikiLeaks and Anonymous time, I really realized like, that this was a, a moment in history. Yeah, and I was, I was involved with a bunch of really crazy people that got, it, that got arrested and were doing all this stuff, but I totally realized at the time that at some point in the future that that stuff would actually be recognized by the modern art world. And so there are printed versions of these internet memes that came out of just exactly this period that do end up in galleries and do actually have their value. Um, so the fine art world definitely at some point follows whatever it is that's going on uh, in, the, in the art world, is, is my personal experience. I didn't see any money from it, um, but I don't, I don't really care about that because I think my favorite quote is from Cory Doctorow, that um, the worst thing for an artist is not to be poor, but the worst thing for an artist is to be irrelevant. And so if you can, if you can find a place that you exist in the trajectory of art history, then you've accomplished something. And speaking to what you're talking about is that this is probably the most unique thing about blockchain art is that, um, is that, that we actually have provenance timestamping for the first time. That we actually have provable provenance uh, for digital art. It's fast. So yeah.
So what's really interesting in, in, in this sense is you have things like Photoshop battles. You guys know that, that, that came out of uh, uh, what starts with a D, the online community. Um, DeviantArt, right? So Photoshop battles. And so uh, then we have Super Rare also is another, is another thing in the space, uh, one of the status incubates. So what you have is they have the possibility that every derivative work has a key pair that's associated with it and makes it very, very interesting, this, this community collaborative activity that can happen when people are remixing uh, their, their stuff and that everything then has a unique hash. And I think that that's also probably one of the most unique things about if we're going to talk about blockchain art is that that sort of art can't really exist without the blockchain. The art itself is a piece, but a time-stamped piece of art, you know, provable provenance can't exist without the blockchain. I think that's a very, very key aspect of that, of that question that you're asking. Um, just one quick thing on, on that before answering your question. Um, um, yeah, I mean, that's the technical layer of blockchain really just allowed for the first time to have limited edition and scarcity for digital art, which could not be made you know, before. Um, and, and to go back in your, uh, to your question on how the art world or art market like, would see and categorize um, memes and, and you know, even like, you know, like digital art that you have on Super Rare, I think that would be like, um, I mean, very basically defined as the collectible, like the same way a baseball card uh, would be uh, categorized as, as that, it would be a digital collectible. Um, but I don't know if the real question is how the art world would see that because I mean, from my experience, every time you talk about a piece of digital art uh, to someone, a collector who um, collects, like even video art, um, but um, but or traditional uh, physical paintings or artworks, um, the first question is, oh, can I print it? Okay, well, not not super the point, uh, and and there's still this physicality that in like the digital art and memes and everything that they will miss. And, and honestly, the art market is like, collectors are like very, it's, the number is like really small. I mean, it's a tiny market. So what they've been looking for with all the website and, and the online platform, they always, I mean, it's been 10 years that like, you know, I hear like, we're gonna bring you the Silicon Valley money and they're all gonna collect art. And everybody is like, Lily is like, well, I don't need art. Like, you know, I probably don't have walls to like, put art and, and I change locations and I'm mobile and, and, and everything. So I think the code to crack or like the, the question to answer is also like what will make the, like we talk about blockchain community but also like the tech community. I think it's the first time blockchain community you can actually talk to a community that is easily de definable. So, um, so it's kind of used as a, as a test group uh, if you want to like see what the techies would like collect because it's like you know, print, paintings, not really, and everything, I mean, we all have all our, like, life on our phones, like, look, Matei is on his phone, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and we don't have, uh, like, um, you know, collections, like, art collections on our phones, like, which is kind of um, sad, because we haven't found what really interests people. It's not just, like, a uh, super rare is fun, but it's, like, GIFs and, and 2D, like, artworks, so it's, like, okay, but what else? Is there, like, a gambling element, uh, like, something else that is missing, uh, so that art becomes something that is also part of um, people's life? Because we're creatives. I mean, developers are creative, like, you know, like, you were talking about design. Design is creativity, so we all need creativity, but not necessarily art, so I think that's... Mm -hmm. I would, I would just like to say something potentially um, in terms of kind of taking it high level and then narrowing it down. Um, I do think blockchain art, just as a phrase, um, is something that's deployed very much to gain territory, both in the art world and kind of in between and in the blockchain space as well. And I don't mean gain territory in the sense that that's always negative. I think that there's a lot of good projects using it to gain territory in like traditional art world, like say Ruth Catlow and Furtherfield and their DAWO program and the way that they're using both kind of for two examples of works that have come from that program is the crypto certificate and the, um, what would you do? So crypto certificate, I forget the exact details. It launched last weekend, I haven't seen them all. But it's the idea that you can invest in an artist over the time span of their career. But also the artist who did it, Ed Pernilas, um, tends to do kind of 
LARP or more performance-based practice. So there also is a performative aspect to the artist saying that you will invest in me over my career. Um, and the way that that transaction happens, you could actually consider performative. And then there's another LARP that's just like, uh, what would you do if you could buy an island? <laughs> um, with, you know, kind of the, the great wealth transfer with ICOs. And just like that imaginary space um, that that opened up and not in the hyper-capitalistic way of like, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could buy an island? But just in the kind of vagueness of not knowing what that historical um, newness of the weird ICO craze was, like asking what the fuck that was. Um, so I think blockchain art as a territory and as a narrative can be deployed really usefully to like reclaim and re-navigate. Um, in terms of like blockchain art, whether it needs a blockchain or not, that's less specific to me. It's more of like what are the kind of like semantic qualities, you could say immutability, you could say um, like a consensus protocol, um, a certain kind of transparency, a certain type of linear time. I think it's quite funny to say blockchains inspire time travel because they actually solidify time much more than other technologies. Um, just all of these various things, if you were to like define a series of properties of what the imaginary or schematic of a blockchain was and then create work related to that, that to me I would consider blockchain art. Whether it's needed to be called that, it depends on like what territory you want to gain, in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, I just want to ask really quickly, Pepe Dabsky, when and now. Um, what do you think about NFT license V2? Um, I, I think it's... Um, I, I think... Um, like, as far as licensing, it's... So it's... When it comes to, like, using the blockchain, you just kind of are able to transcend some of this, these situations of, like, having to claim rights. Like, it's in the smart contract that the artist gets paid automatically, so you kind of, you don't have to worry as much about that, but it becomes really interesting when you want to do prints or like exploring like actual physical items because attaching the blockchain to any physical item, whether you're talking about supply chain or you're talking about memes or digital trading cards, you know, you then like kind of have to pull away from how do you associate it, then you have to be able to, you know, put a private key or something on the card and like show that it's unique. What if in our case we have kind of like a semi-fungible um, standard where you can issue one to a hundred cards and each of those cards, it's, it's not essentially an NFT, it's like the one through a hundred, there is no disassociation. Um, and then like a standard ER721, it's like one, two, three, four, and so on you, of those hundred issued cards. So it kind of, there's like a few variations of like how important a license can be. Uh, but I think it, for me personally, it's more interesting when I go to talk to the artist and they're like, hey, um, you know, we're exploring physical forms of this, and then all of a sudden they're like, well, we don't want you guys to sell our physical cards and we not have any money from this, right? And then you have to think about that. So uh, that kind of just happened organically. We were just making a fun little project on Ethereum with people on the internet that we, don't even, we haven't even really met, right? It's kind of a bottom-up project in, in my experience. I don't know, I, I think all of you guys probably have heard of this NFT license. Is it called V2 or NFT license? Like NFT license, you heard of this, right? So basically Dapper Labs, uh, I think CryptoKitties um, uh, company, uh, they came up like not so long ago with this uh, idea of NFT license V2, I think. Um, that um, if you are a Dapp uh, maker or artist, um, I think mostly Dapp maker, you basically can put this clause in your like TNC. And this would, I mean, they claim that this is like the new wave, the new uh, an up upgraded version of an IP, right? Because once you basically put your art on, on the blockchain or you have digital art, then it is very like, like a blur, blurry area that um, can you... Um, earn some money from this art uh, by, you know, like produce, reproducing some physical copies of these arts, right? Um, so this um, license say that, okay, for example, if I buy, let's say CryptoKitties, they have this uh, NFT license, right? So then if I buy one cat right now on CryptoKitties, then um, this cat, I can print, you know, this cat, you know, and uh, I don't know, put on my t-shirt or create it a bag with the image of this cat uh, and sell it commercially up to 100,000 pieces. And then this is, so it, it gives like a really new thought about this. So it means that when I buy one token of CryptoKitties, it's not just that I have this thing on the blockchain, NFT, yada, yada, but I have the right to reproduce this art 
for 100,000 pieces in the real world and sell it, right? And I mean, like, this, this thing I think is actually super cool, but it's also defeating the whole purposes because, I mean, imagine if I'm, like, the artist, right? Let's say I'm on Super Rare, known origin, right? And I create this artwork, and um, I, I told uh, John on Super Rare that, uh, oh, please tokenize this, like, five edition of my art. <laughs> and, and you bought my art, and you, like, go around and, like, you know, open a fashion shop, like, printing my art because of this license. It just... I think it's like a, this is a big like discussion in the like NFT like kind of bubble, but then uh, I, I like I, I don't have a solution for it, but it's also kind of interesting as well, right? Because maybe there's a sim some new kind of incentive for people to buy um, this collectible, right? Um, so because they can like kind of you know like get some income from it, but uh, what does it mean for an artist, for instance? So, well, Right, but are we talking about collectibles or are we talking about art? Uh, and art is a collectible, but not all collectibles are art. No. No. Well, yeah, but I think it's, it's an unfair distinction to say, like, does an artist care about getting paid or do they care about creating? I know, but I, I'm just saying I think it's really important to not have that distinction because, like, an artist like is always cares about creating and an artist always deserves to get paid and so I just think that's a dichotomy that like you know it's really puts an unfair onus on artists to like make a choice between that when it's always placed as like a binary so I just wanted to I, I think it's really sorry I'll, I'll get the mic to you just I'm gonna answer the collectible I think it's really quite funny made a good point before saying that you know collectible is for example um, football cards or hockey cards then, you know, where the distinction go, that's, a, that's also another discussion to have. But, you know, collectible can also be an ice hockey card or a football card. Potentially, that could turn into an art piece later or could be seen as an art piece. I mean, that is a discussion to be had. I don't know if there's an answer to it, but... Um, hi. <laughs> I'm not from the artsy work, <laughs> from the artsy world. Um, I'm just wondering a bit why everyone is so focused always on on the vision aspect uh, of, of art. I mean, there's so much art in this world which you just cannot see. So from what I understand from the art market is, of course, um, it always needs to be some, most of the time, some visual experience. There's also other arts. But um, although it also accounts to the arts market that um, knowledge is, is actually the power of vision, right? So to value some, some piece of artwork, you need to have the certain um, background information to really uh, give it a value, but to give an example of uh, another beautiful piece of art where you just need to have a basic understanding of things are uh, that somebody um, not too long ago, I think it was two years ago, someone injected um, a signature of, of some malware into a Bitcoin transaction. So basically, everybody's antivirus software deleted all their um, Bitcoin data from their from their um, computers. So like these things that happen basically under the radar of this visual scope of perception, they're actually sometimes so beautiful that it's just too bad that people don't recognize. And, and if we're talking about um, art and blockchain, there's already so much so much beautiful stuff in in the blockchain world because it relies, for example, on cryptography, right? And uh, to a normal person, this can seem to be like magic. We have so many things in blockchains, like zero knowledge proofs, right? So you can rely on something to be somewhere, although you will never see it. Like ring signatures, you know that something is part of 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 something which components you will never see. Homomorphic encryption, right? So you can take a couple of things and turn them into something totally different and then do something with it and then turn it back and you will have a desired result without even knowing how you got there, but you can trust the way you got there, right? So why not maybe like focus a bit on more kind of these admittingly more complicated things which take a couple of papers to, to, to sweat over, um, but to maybe somewhere get on a higher level um, in, in, in the whole art sphere. 
I, 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 I'm, I think I'm missing a point here. You know, I, I, I get it. Technology is beautiful. Algorithms are gorgeous. Uh, you know, uh, bugs are actually, uh, it can be seen as performance art at some degree, but not because of that. We should actually focus only on that and relegate the art world because it's not as complex and as beautiful as your algorithm. I, I think it's two different categories, and uh, you know, they can be together. You know, uh, an algorithm can be used to actually run an, uh, a massive art, art installation. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, you know, these kind of, you know, yeah. But you know, let's uh, everything is art because algorithms are beautiful. I, I don't think it's a, I, I don't think it helps anyone because it doesn't help the art world and it doesn't help the technologies. What are technologies now? artist then by your definition I I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by by this kind of reasoning because we are trying to do something for people that don't have technical expertise but that have a lot to to give to this world too so would you actually denigrate these people of access to a uh, to study uh, if they don't have CK proof knowledge or whatever you uh, or whatever kind of beautiful algorithm you want to use Okay, then this is not the discussion for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then you can ask if you want to have me explain it. Just take a Picasso and paint it over black. That, that, that would be, that would be a applying of so many um, beautiful logical implications which you could really transfer into the art world really easily. The erase de Kooning kind of does that. It's a there's a there's a famous piece that's uh, by de Kooning that was erased um, by Rauschenberg. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this is an, an interesting idea for sure. And I think true, true. I, I think actually, what to speak to what you're saying is is we should probably be clear about what we're talking about by the art world too. Is what you brought up before, and I think probably people are kind of talking about the contemporary art world, which is essentially uh, extremely contextual conversation. Uh, it's, it's exactly in this moment, and it's only here because of the moments that came exactly before it. The works which are being sold or interesting right now are only that way because of the works which were sold or were made and the moments preceding to this moment. Um, and so the question of like, is it art, I feel like is actually a super dead end question. And a much more interesting one is, is it good art? And I'd like to see the same thing sort of being applied to blockchain. Like, in a way, I think if anything, blockchain art as a term could be harmful because all it does is sort of accelerate or celebrate artwork which does a gimmick, which is the fact that it uses blockchain and it really leaves out the question is, does this art matter? Is it interesting? Does it have any legs to stand on besides the fact that it has blockchain trademark stamped on it? Well, to your point, I think this is like blockchain. You don't need blockchain art as like a category. I mean, this is like... You know, what you were saying is conceptual art. I absolutely agree this is like art because it's like if it has like a, um, you know, an idea or concept uh, uh, on top of like what the algorithm, like maybe an artist had an idea of, you know, plantoids like from Philippi de and I never know her name, the Primavera is like, um, yeah, it's very much like talking about, I mean, someone from whatever we call the art market is like, would never like buy a plantoid, but like someone from this community, I would totally buy a plantoid if I could. Like you know, it's it's an amazing piece of art. It's a concept. It talks about DAOs. Uh, it explains to people like what the fuck is a DAO? Like in a sculpture and an algorithm. I mean, you could imagine a piece of art that would be. Um, you know, just the concept would be like um, every time it's a smart contract, every time it changes hand or owner, it like changes and mutates. And, and as you said, there's so many things happening. And literally, you can take any single blockchain concept and make a conceptual artwork about it, a good or a bad one. Fair enough, but it's like if you have an artist with like a conception, and we've worked at, so I worked at a company called Snark.art, and this is kind of the approach that we've been taking, like talking with artists 
um, we probably already have a market in like more video art or something, but want to experiment with concepts uh, like that or have been familiar or are former CTOs or people already involved um, in, in the blockchain art and want to take these concepts to a more um, creative level. And honestly, like, you know, Plento is one. I mean, we've not seen that many like that. Um, and we're trying to change that. But it's, it's also, it's great. I mean, at the conference, everybody gets what a DAO is in like two seconds. Uh, I'm not so much on the technical side. And like most conferences, I'm like, oh my God, like, what are we even talking about? So if you could use a creative example um, or concept like that to explain any concept that we're working with, it's amazing. And then it's not a question like, do you get accepted by the art market? Let them collect paintings. Like, I mean, for God's sake, like you can collect like this type of art, you know? We can be like the digital art collectors. We don't need to convert like um, traditional collectors into whatever we want them to be, you know? Fuck them. So yeah, I've been trying to get to this point of, of RFTs, refungible tokens. So everybody's talking about NFTs and there's this guy named Dan Long, uh, who's, out, who's, who's basically in the New York uh, art scene, um, who's done this refungible token standard, uh, EIP. Sorry, that's my standard. <laughs> right. That's mine. Oh, you're working with Dan on that? No, Dan's working with me on that. <laughs> okay, cool. So you're probably really surprised to see that up here. Okay, nice to be, <laughs> nice to meet you, Billy. <laughs> okay, cool. Just, just, just for some free advertising for Billy, that's Billy's GitHub handle. It's his favorite social network. You should just follow him there. <laughs> cool. So I mean, why don't you talk about this? Because what you guys are doing is really interesting. If we, if you want to talk about so like shared ownership and financing and funding artists, um, you know, this is this is a, this is one of those potential developments in the area. I mean, I think that art and blockchain has been a topic for a lot of reasons. On one side, you have what's essentially just a new form of technology, which fits into sort of technology art, but you have also what is a potential new financial tool. And I think that's actually why it's a little more exciting, especially in the art context. And uh, as we've already talked on with intellectual property, um, there's just sort of new configurations which are available. One would be shared ownership, fractionalizing small things, creating marketplaces where there was never enough liquidity or traction for a market to exist. And this is one of the things that a blockchain really enables, so this, this micro-transaction, micro-ownership, not only in terms of like benefiting or profiting, but in terms of funding ongoing art. That enables this so self-similar reiteration, remix, sort of, uh, sort of culture. I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind from... of embarrassed, this is really funny. <laughs> I have no skin in that game. It's just one of the things that I think is really cool that's happening in the, in the space. Yeah, I just want to bring a little testimonial to the table because I don't consider myself part of any art scene. I'm not an artist whatsoever. Um, but uh, I went a few months ago on the Super Rare website and I sort of bought into my first piece of digital art. Um, and so I, ever since I've been talking about that experience to a lot of people because for me it really sort of felt like uh, like a similar experience of sending my first email back in the days or even doing my first crypto transaction with someone because in the beginning if you just read about the concepts it really doesn't really make sense it's like okay you're just basically buying a JPEG which I can just send out in an email or whatnot but it's only at the moment that you actually buy that piece of hardware and sort of buy into that scarcity that it starts making sense. And so I just want to give, bring that testimonial to the table. So I think for one thing, if uh, blockchain could help or could have helped the, the, the art world right now, is sort of lowering the barrier because I've never bought any piece of art before. Um, so I just bought my first thing like for a few dollars. So like the financial aspect aside, it's just that special experience that it brings to the table. Um, I think it's, it's sort of commoditizes that, it makes it accessible to a lot more people, so uh, my, uh, myself included. Yeah, sure, I mean... Yeah, so if, if for one thing that uh, like blockchain could already help like in a practical way, I think it's lowering that barrier for like just people like me, just to uh, like site observers that now are actually interacting with that scene instead of just being a, a bystander to it. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, I think what will be really interesting is uh, augmented reality because I think there will be adoption of that before virtual reality. So it's like if it, in your house it was just like white walls like this, but you had your 
like uh, NFTs displayed on the walls. So I think that can be really interesting once that starts to happen. Two weeks ago in Vienna, I was at an exhibition where actually it's an AR application that's written by a Viennese company. Um, and uh, actually uh, with uh, not only provenance on, on, the, on the blockchain, but if you, don't, if you don't have the address, you can't actually see it. So it's a 3D AR where you look at a painting and then there's multiple layers that you can that you can go around, and if you don't have the private, if you don't have the key, you can't. Uh, so it's it's linked with a multi-sig wallet as well that you can't actually see the whole piece unless it is that you have the uh, the access to the key, which you get through an application, and it's an AR application. Nice. Very very cool stuff. Oh, hi, I'm Matthew, and uh, actually I'm most this is quite off topic, and I'm interested in the RFTs as well. So hi, Billy, and actually I would like to ask you what do you think the, the economy of the arts, how it looks like or change the the second markets of the arts? Uh, how would uh, change the economy? How are actually now NFT are traded, and how it uh, change the economy on the second markets with the RFTs? Secondary, Secondary markets, sorry. Yeah. How how would uh... Uh, um, I mean, probably you'd see a more accurate price around art assets, which is probably not what a lot of the art world would want. Uh, the art world benefits from a lot of information asymmetry. A lot of pieces are locked up. Prices are withheld. You can't really, you're not allowed to sell in different moments if you're not doing great in the marketplace because every time you sell, you basically reestablish your baseline of value. Uh, and so having pieces sold constantly would would sort of have a constantly changing price if that were to go through. I mean, I, I have a little hesitation that it actually would because of you know, the, the problems that it would bring with it. Okay, okay thank you. It's just, um, it's an extension to ERC-20. So like normal tokens that there's a lot of infrastructure for already with exchanges and things like that. Um, it sort of, goes from the point of view in which you already have a non-fungible token being used either as uh, IP provenance or as a conceptual sort of stand-in for work, whether that work is a conceptual work or a physical work. Um, and it's just a really simple infrastructure for letting that non-fungible non -fungible token be owned by the contract of the fungible token. So instead of like me, a user with a public key, being the owner of that uh, NFT, it's, it's another token who is the owner of that NFT. So in that way, when you buy or sell that token who is the owner of that NFT, in a way it's like you're buying and selling pieces of that NFT. So there's no single person who's able to hold the NFT. Nobody owns it. It's just a contract who owns it. And that contract is a fungible token that could but be traded. What, what are the use cases? Maybe one like main use, use case? I mean, you could very easily pivot over uh, assets which were represented as fungible to, or as non-fungible tokens into a shared ownership scenario. It's fractional ownership. So maybe it's relevant to people. So um, at the like kind of co-working blockchain space that um, I run like this um, art gallery out of. So basically a question that we have is like if we um, like if there is an artwork that you know is funded by a certain amount of people, that's I guess this artwork would be an NFT, and then the funds from funding the artwork kind of uh, create like a residency situation for the artist. And then, you know, over time, a residency program is able to grow out of um, the funds that are created linked to these specific pieces. Is that a uh, use case for your thing? I think, yeah, because none of the existing, you know, scenarios with like non-fungible tokens have exactly worked for, um, yeah, like funding this in a way that's able to be circular. So I'm really excited about what you just said because I think that um, really opens up like, uh, I don't know, creating network effects with art. So, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, so, I mean, Dan, that's what Dan's interested in, is that actually that fractional ownership of existing expensive artworks. And I'm much more excited about this actual application of it, tying NFTs to, a, to an FT to actually enable work to be created. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't care about, like, why would I want to own a piece of an expensive thing? I want to put forward, I want to, you know, have the speculative nature of enabling 
art to exist and artists to be supported in ways that don't exist yet. So what's interesting about that is that this play is actually like on the level of the New York art market and Guggenheim and like insurance companies own a lot of this stuff. These are the people who got to pitch to. Yeah. And I mean, I think yeah. In their in their defense, I don't think that's the only one though. I mean, I think that the idea is that it's multifaceted. With regard to the, the, the standard, it's, it's kept extremely flexible for all sorts of those sorts of schemes to be used around it and still be able to use the sort of exchanges and infrastructure that's already there. And also just as a point with the art blocks, I mean, I think that they have kind of a smart strategy in that they sort of focus on traditional art world for basically financing what is the other arm of the company, the labs, which is funding experiments and making these sorts of new possibilities uh, live. Yeah, and I, I mean, a lot of art blocks will be an open protocol, so just one other thing is I'm not super interested in bringing fintech or derivatives to the art market that's immutable, like that's not very interesting, but if you can work in certain things like with art blocks, like resale value as an artist kind of grows over time, like maybe some of um, the like, like RFT using some of the fractional ownership to use an artwork that appreciates over time to pay back the artist, to me, that's like one of the biggest crimes that happens in current art infrastructure, that you can sell a piece for 500, and then, you know, if you're lucky, it's like 500K, and that's just a total crime that the artist doesn't see any of that. So just being able to work with like major existing players and to actually make that kind of like an immutable part of the protocol is really useful as well. Because there's um, always a residual royalty payment going to the artist mm -hmm. at every sale that's written into the contract. Yeah, it could be like 10% of every resale goes to the artist, and that would already be a huge way to fund. I mean, granted, you still have to be successful and participate in the art market as is, so it's not like a perfect fix, but just the fact that like that isn't like a function of these protocols yet surprises me. Art blocks, they said, you know, oh, we'll work it in. <laughs> but like. <laughs> I mean, it is a really difficult problem. I think there was a work in the 70s, um, artist contract uh, that sort of got circulated as conceptual work that was like, everybody should use this contract when they sell work. It includes perpetual um, uh, returns on it. Do you know who made it? Hans Hockner? Hakka. Hans Hakka. Um, but I mean, say you build that into the protocol with a token transfer, you can still get around that. I mean, you can wrap tokens and make the transfer free, whereas the original tokens had like a tax. Like it's, it's gonna be a cat and mouse problem even on a blockchain actually. Just for devil's advocate on that point. <laughs> Just playing the devil's advocate as well on, uh, on one thing that, um, you know, it's, it's like all the technicality of, of blockchain is very interesting and, and, and especially royalties and, and things that we only see right now in a few, very few countries and California, I think, uh, for like the um, royalties paid to the artists. Um, but it's always like, it, it can be the first advantage because for royalties you need like sales and volume and, and things happening and be traded. So it's really about, for me, like building this market and, and seeing more actors and, you know, we're talking about established artists or emerging artists and, 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 and et cetera. But it's, you need all of that to create a market. I mean, we need to create the primary market where uh, with all this, I mean, at that point I'm talking about the digital <laughs> um, okay, uh, side of things. I think that that's what's unique about, uh, about blockchains in relationship to art is that you have this dual use of, of provable provenance and trackable micro microfinancing yeah, in but whichever it's, it's, sense. It's great technical idea and for the first time ever like blockchain allows us to do things like that, but it's not the technology that's gonna build the market. 
like we need to like find users and and you know like uh, collectors and explain to people like what they can do like uh, find what is interesting to which audience like to the traditional art market to like new people new collectors um, etc and I think that's um, you know I think in 2018 to go back to your slide it's like a lot of talks were just like royalties and you're like there's no market there's no royalties like. No, and I think you're making a very valid point, like coming back to it again, is that that there is so much possibilities within within blockchain for for artists such as royalties or you know, getting 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 money when your your piece is getting resold. However, uh, <laughs> however, well, if, I don't consider a royalty market, doesn't necessarily the, mean to me a financial thing. No, so, royalty sorry, royalty me, can be can my, be reputation. Yes, it could, but then also you can't really Reputation you can't live off, unfortunately, not yet. I mean, like, your reputation might give you more money, but ideally royalty will be something that can allow you to live a bit better. Because that's also, like, that is a problem within, within the art market, is that people don't get paid. And there are projects on the primary market, like, for, like, new artists. I mean, we were talking about supporting uh, street artists. Um, I mean, maybe it's not my project, but you can maybe explain, like, a little bit more... I think there are not enough projects on like, yeah, like primary mark, like helping artists. Yeah, I, I, uh, we are, um, I'm from Artcard. We are trying to build a project here coming from Berlin and trying to support the graffiti scene and street art scene. And like, we took a lot from PPD apps, like for our prototypes, took the ERC for, for 20 contracts yeah, from them. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, we, we are trying to, to um, enable artists who are especially artists doing illegal art, like painting trains and stuff, and they, they have no way to monetize their work. And also, like, no way, like, it's, clear, uh, it's very transient art, like, it's cleaned away the next day or two days later. People only invest, like, in investing money, taking risks to do this kind of stuff. And we are trying to support them by enabling them to offer trading cards and selling them on a the platform. And like we also, we added some functions like to the ERC for 20 contract, like enabling a donate function, like to donate for, for the artist without buying the actual card. Mm -hmm. And we are looking like into ways to, um, yeah, to, to store pictures on the blockchain in different ways, like um, yeah, IPFS or also like transforming a small picture into a string of data and mapping it to yeah, mapping it to the to the token ID in the contract and stuff like that. Um, I think there are like many many possibilities to use this technique, like especially to support artists who have no uh, yeah no other possibilities. We should uh, talk. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, one th we were talking about like new economies, and like I think earlier it's like maybe misunderstood. Like this is about the artists being able to just be at the forefront. So one thing we haven't talked too much about is gaming. So I'm really interested now. After going through the d digital trading card, and it kind of went through a big phase in 2017-18, is now gaming. So we're seeing slowly but surely we're seeing some games where the artists will create these assets, and then all of a sudden the artist is like profiled with the game. That, I've never seen that personally, you know, or I've seen, you know, occasionally like an indie game scene, you can see this, but in like big production gaming, you don't see the artists that actually create the product that like you're actually looking at, right? And it's more about the programming and all that. So now you, you get both. And I, I'm really interested now in looking at in-game assets, the artists being able to essentially like come in and crowdsource the art and be able to say, okay, I'll, like 10 artists can make a game now, you know, or ongoingly an artist can submit assets to games. And then those skins can be tradable on other, they, they, it's, a, it's Ethereum. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like an abstract like hash signature of Ethereum and there, it's gonna be tradable in one way or another. So there's like things like wax and, and other stuff too, but um, you're, the artist is able now to, to come in, contribute to things in an open format, really a like really low barrier and not just in the sense of like getting money, but just coming in. With Pepe Dapp, it's like join our Telegram group. We have an artist group and they just submit to us on a Google form and we're gonna automate that process eventually to where they just like 
schedule a launch and it launches a smart contract, right? Same thing for games, same things for like, you know, digital comics and, and other types of multimedia, um, even movies and things. I think this will eventually be with AR implied. Uh, it's gonna be pretty interesting. Um, just on the sorry, just one note. Right. We are starting to, um, we need to stop this quite soon because we've got how much time do we've got left? Um, it, it's at four, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so 15 minutes. We've got 15 minutes left, right. so. I just have one question. Um, just on the subject of provenance and the blockchain, what is to stop somebody putting a fake and a forgery on the blockchain um, and uh, ripping people off? and pretending to be an artist or... But it, it's, it's still there, it's still on the blockchain. I'm just interested if anyone's got any views on, on that. Yeah, sorry, just to make it clear, uh, someone could take art that someone's already made and pretend they're the author and put it on the blockchain and then all the royalties forever go to them instead of the actual artist. I what? think that's what you... Have you heard meant. that case? Have you heard the case of, um, uh, so there's this art registry called uh, Veris Art, uh, which was one of the first one um, um, pretty much made, uh, and um, someone took a picture of the Mona Lisa and said he was the author and put it on the art registry. I mean, it will happen, like, there is a ton of shit on the blockchain, like, ton of fake stuff, and, and it will happen with art. I mean, this is like, um, like, all these art registries is like, even if you, um, you know, you say like, oh, this was sold at this place, uh, you still, for art that already existed prior to blockchain or that is outside of the digital um, art, um, like with living artists, like you will rely on external ex uh, information that might be wrong and blockchain is never going to fix that. A lot of projects actually chose to start with um, uh, like blank, like with like art or artworks that just were created so that they avoid this problem of like past data or like fake and, and things like that. But a, va a vast majority of the, of the modern contemporary art that's in private collected hands and in galleries are forgeries that were, you know, funded by the CIA from, you know, okay? So I mean, the art market, you know, I mean, forgeries and value and whatever, I mean, there's literally, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of forged paintings that are hanging in galleries and, and, and huge collections, responsible collections, and they're all forgeries, yeah? I mean. There was a story who came out last, end of last year, I can't remember who the artist is and where the museum is, but essentially it was a museum dedicated to this one artist and a, a archivist went through it and it turned out that 60% of the collection was actually fake. So, I mean, that is, that is a problem that is just like in, in, you said and you said as yeah, well, it's something that it's really artists. existing. <laughs> But in terms of art which is created now, what about interoperability? Because if it, it, I'm trying to still, I'm relatively new to the blockchain. If you look at the blockchain as a database, then there can be other databases and other blockchains. So wouldn't the answer be to have interoperability between all the different blockchains? And then if you had somebody that actually created a work of art, if somebody else put, made it on another part of another blockchain saying they would have created it, the interoperability element might counter that. I'm just. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still no good solution. I mean, I don't know if you look at the art registries. I mean, they're all. It's kind of like a also a, a one gets all type of business model right now. It's like you can't have like that many art registries for the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's true that like if 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 I have a JPEG and I upload it. I actually don't know. That's a very good question because even if I make a d digital um, art piece and um, and just you know like copy it um, and upload it to another you know like you upload your original digital art on Superair and I upload like a screenshot of yours on another platform. I mean then we go back to like 
um, curation a little bit of these platforms. Like, are they doing their due diligence? Are they like, do they know you? Do they know like who you are, uh, or do they accept any single thing? Um, and a lot of people have been. I mean, that's a different debate, but a lot of people have been against like curation for most of these platforms, um, saying curation is um, not decentralized. Like, so they should not like these platforms should not be curated. Uh, we should have systems like peer-to-peer -peer curation, like with token curated registries, for example. But um, but we're not at that scale yet. Yeah, yet. So we need like a, a, a in mid, in between uh, solution to create um, this platform so that they until they pick up and um, other systems kick in. Okay, so I think this might be the last one. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I really liked your point about curation and I just, I don't know, maybe this kind of ties it together and it's also what I really think is cool about like, or one of the things about the connection with blockchain and art, which is like this question of like, who is a curator and who should curate things and what does it mean for things to be curated and not curated, I think just um, puts a pen in the, uh, you know, just a, like a threshold in um, this question of like, what should be decentralized and what shouldn't be decentralized because like, you know, the role of a curator is to like tie, you know, a bunch of things together into one theme and to be held in the space in the same way but then that also means that knowledge is being presented in a certain pattern like in a certain context so you know I just really like that and I you know look forward to seeing how y'all solve that particular question because I think it's something that could be a paradigm for you know decentralized collaboration in general and to say you know who decides which things are considered to be part of each other so No worries, there's always Twitter. <laughs> so we're also doing a um, decentralized um, uh, art festival, and it's a Rare AF2. Um, I don't know if you were familiar with the Rare AF1 that happened last year in January. Um, so we took it over a little bit, and now it's not linked to a brand. It's like totally decentralized. It's a little bit of a mess to organize. Right, Bess? <laughs> but it's, it's going to be fun, and it's just about uh, Rare AF memes, uh, NFTs, now other types as well, and, uh, and geeking out about it. It's not like mainstream adoption or anything. It's just, you know, like having fun with it, creating NFTs, uh, buying, selling, winning NFTs. Yeah, so this will happen on, in New York. In New York, yeah. Um, yeah. New York, May 18th. Come hang out. Okay, guys, uh, so we need to close. Yeah, we need to close this discussion. Thank you for everyone participating and everyone who's been here listening to it. Um, I think there was a lot of things that were said, every, or everything said was really, really interesting and was a lot of food for thought for me, at least. Yeah, so the way that we... So, first of all, this was all a performance, guys. Thank you for participating. No, I'm joking, actually. Uh, no, so uh, the way forward from here, we intend to write this report, and we intend to also make it into something publishable so that these kind of discussions are had, are have a... Uh, uh, I happen more often, not only here, but uh, you know, in a decentralized way, as you say. So what I'm going to do in the next couple of days, we are going to prepare a form, and we're going to add all the material, the recording, yeah. and then we're going to add a form where you can write your 500 words, and that's going to get integrated into a wider report, and then you're going to get uh, the chance to peer review it. Please stay within 500 words. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, you're going to find it in our website. So it's not, it's not set up yet. Yeah, yeah. Follow, follow the Twitter. You'll find out. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. It's going to be decentralala.com. <laughs> dot com? No, dot there or dot com. Don't worry. I'll put it on Twitter too. <laughs> East Berlin. <laughs> East Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Afri, are we ready? Okay. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what should we do now?
Yeah. Okay, cool. So we should go to the other room because something cool is going to happen, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> oh, shit.